good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, if you happen to be in uh, Birmingham, uh, where John Luca is uh, joining us from. My name is Adam Blackwell, the Vice President of International Development Services Group, and on behalf of the team at the Global Terrorism Trends and Analysis Center, I'll be moder moderating this session titled Wagner, Hybrid and Conventional Warfare, Combat Power and Combat Effectiveness of the Private Military Company in Africa and the Ukraine. And Ukraine. This is a continuation of a series of talks by eminent people in the field of terrorism. The views expressed are those of the presenter. Gianluca Capovan is a team manager at Jane's, where he heads two sections monitoring military forces in armed conflict through open source intelligence, OSINT. Prior to joining uh, Jane's, Gianluca served in the Italian army for 20 years. From 2017 and 21, Gianluca was a member of the Italian armed forces delegation at NATO. Uh, he has served in the Italian army amphib amphibious infantry uh, and the mountain infantry, or Alpine. In the, and in the course of his military service, Gianluca deployed to Bosnia, Herzegovina, Lebanon, and three times to Afghanistan. He will speak for about 20 minutes. We will then have about 20 minutes for discussion. So please use the Q&A function in Zoom and prepare your questions as Gianluca is speaking. Gianluca, over to you. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Adam, and for inviting me to speak today. I also wanted to thank the GTAC staff for arranging this event. As you can imagine, I have a lot to say, but due to time constraints, I will focus on a series of case studies and I will not be able to cover every country where Wagner operates. Now I wanted to share quickly a presentation. Just let me know when you can see it. We can see it. Okay, perfect. Okay. So the aim of this presentation is to describe the result of the analysis of our data collection regarding the Wagner private military company in Africa and Ukraine. And uh, what we wanted to highlight, uh, it's uh, its capacity to shift uh, from a security entity involved uh, in hybrid warfare, basically Russia's longa manus, to a conventional warfighting force uh, able to perform uh, complex military operations uh, in a highly intensity warfighting scenario. Although for the purpose of this presentation, we will analyze the case study of Wagner Group, most of the principles that we present here can be extended to dozens of private military companies currently linked to Russian interests globally. Here you will see just a few of them listed to the right. It's just a short uh, list. We counted more than 37 associated to, the, to Russian interests. And uh, especially after Wagner's mutiny in June, we have seen an increase in size and presence of other PMCs in which, by the way, many Wagner veterans uh, have been incorporated. Of the different levels of warfare, this presentation will privilege the tactical and operational levels, only touching strategic and political contexts uh, tangentially. Therefore, we will talk about uh, Wagner performance of the battlefield and what we can assess from uh, the PMC's behavior. I will spend some time giving you an overview of Wagner's main areas of operation, describing the adaptations, uh, tactics, uh, techniques, and procedures uh, we observed in the seven Wagner's uh, warfighting functions, command and control, maneuver, fires, sustainment, force protection, intelligence, and information. And about this, uh, I will quickly explain a few foundational con concepts uh, in the next slide. Then there will be an assessment of the combat power and combat effectiveness of the PMC, particularly regarding the military operation in, in, in Ukraine, analyzing the lessons learning processes that created Wagner institutional memory. So first and foremost, to understand the action of a military or paramilitary entity, especially on the battlefield, uh, we need to familiarize with a few military concepts uh, that will help you contextualize the overall analysis. The terms are taken from NATO doctrine, 
not because Wagner is using NATO doctrine, but because we need to standard, standardize definitions of some concepts of warfare that are universally valid, whether you call them with uh, Russian names uh, or English names. So the first concept is combat power, which defines the total means of destructive, constructive, and information capabilities that military units can apply at a given time. In other words, available mili military capabilities. We are talking about personnel, high value assets, military equipment, training, sustainment. So it's a quantitative analysis. And then we have combat effectiveness, which is the ability to transform combat power into successful outcomes. And this takes into account how combat power can perform considering the quality of the training, for example, or the quality of logistical capacity, morale, quality of medical treatment, and mortality rate, uh, uh, lesson learning processes, and ability to adapt to changing operational environments. And it is apparent that combat effectiveness has a qualitative nature, something that you cannot clearly measure with numbers. Now let's explore the warfighting functions. So warfighting functions help uh, military entities to integrate and synchronize available capabilities, combat power. Uh, and this is in order to achieve given objectives at every level of warfare, so transforming combat effectiveness. The first is command and control. It's a function that enables the synchronization of the available combat power. While information is the ability to influence an adversary or a third party's perception or action through means such as propaganda, information, disinformation, misinformation, something that we all know Wagner, Wagner is very good at, for example. Then we have intelligence that is what facilitates the understanding of all aspects of the operational environment, from enemy, terrain, weather, adversaries, uh, capabilities in general. And it enables uh, commanders at all level to make uh, informed decisions uh, about the application of combat power and achieve definitive results. Then we have maneuver, which is a set of tasks uh, and systems uh, that move and employ forces to achieve positions of relative advantage uh, over an enemy. Then fires. Fires is very important, especially in Ukraine. Fires is what create uh, lethal and non-lethal effects uh, across the different domains. And in case of Ukraine and Libya, for example, it was primarily in the form of artillery. And we will uh, see how the Wagner groups has employed it. Then we have sustainment, which refers to the capacity of planning and executing the movement of, and support uh, in support of logistic forces, basically all the logistics operations, and then force protection, which consists in uh, all the actions and capabilities that help preserving the available combat power. A typical example of that is air defense. Now, the war fighting functions uh, can employ capabilities belonging to the different domains, land, air, maritime, and space, and deliver effects uh, ac across uh, multiple dimensions, physical, virtual, and cognitive dimensions. However, of all the war fighting functions across the different domains and dimensions, we will start from information. And we will describe how Wagner has tried to influence domestic and international audience perception of the private military company. They built a monumental communication campaign, spreading information, disinformation, misinformation through social media platforms, news, news outlet, and even through action movies all aimed at shaping the image of the company to increase both popular support and boost recruitment. So movies like The Best in Hell, set in Ukraine, or Tourist, set in Central African Republic, always projected an image of success where the PMC is portrayed as a virtually undefeatable, let's say. Their image was built uh, around a set of virtues such as patriotism, devotion to the cause, altruism, heroism, sacrifice, friendship. But uh, they also wanted to be portrayed as ruthless and uh, merciless when necessary, but only against enemies that are pure evil. So in many cases, the information campaign portrayed uh, the Wagner group uh, as the sole actor involved in the fight. It was, for example, the case of the battle for Bakhmut in eastern Ukraine, 
where uh, the Wagner Group wanted to convince uh, uh, domestic and international audience that the PMC was achieving alone the greatest success of the war, emphasizing that, it, that this was something that the Russian military elite uh, failed to achieve. However, it has to be said that uh, among Russian military personnel and certain layers of civil society within Russia and Africa, this campaign has been quite effective. Many Russian soldiers uh, used to wear and still wear the patches or T-shirt, for example, of the PMC, or still today they are displaying Wagner's flags uh, and banners in their shelters in Ukraine, very close to the front. So Russian soldiers uh, often associate uh, to these symbols uh, values such as valor, courage, and sacrifice. And it's all thanks to the information campaign. And in regards to Africa, the PMC continuously denigrates the presence of the United Nations or uh, former, former colonial powers, depicting the non-offensive mandate uh, of the UN, for example, as impotence, and uh, in that specific uh, regional context. Furthermore, they describe a former colonial power. It was the case, for example, for the French or uh, the European training mission in Mali as uh, still intent on maintaining their influence uh, over the region and exploiting both the resources and the population. Regarding the social media policy, the Wagner forces have always maintained a high level of discipline. The group has imposed the strict policies uh, and uh, those that did not abide to the rules uh, were severely punished. As a result, the PMC contractors uh, have been far more careful than their regular Russian army counterparts uh, when it comes to sharing you know, uh, sensitive, sensitive military information or pictures on social media. However, as we all know, what the private military company presented in the fiction and uh, in uh, propaganda was far from the observable reality on the battlefield. And, back, and the Wagner Group never embodied the immaculate qualities represented in the movies and uh, almost never acted alone on the battlefield. So let's now take a closer look at Ukraine, where Wagner was able to express uh, its combat power to its maximum, building a credible fighting force at a core level. Wagner forces were primarily, but not solely, deployed in the area of Bakhmut, a town that, uh, as a military objective, is of little tactical importance and probably virtually no operational value. Here we have the map of, the, um, of eastern and southern Ukraine, and the area in red uh, representing the portion of Ukraine, uh, ter Ukrainian territory under Russian control following February 2022 invasion, and the high density clusters of events uh, north uh, of the city of Donetsk, that you, you can see in the slide, indicates uh, Wagner's uh, battle space uh, in Bakhmut. Wagner forces engaged the Ukrainian army in an attritional battle with the aim of diverting Ukrainian resources from other sectors of the front. At the same time, Russian forces launched a series of uh, localized offensive and subtactical attacks across a broad frontage from north to the south, which, however, did not result in, in um, any significant uh, territorial change but, and that's very important, enabled Russian forces to conduct and complete the construction of formidable defensive lines uh, in a record time. In fact, because military operations uh, always need to be understood, uh, understood as a, an overall system, Wagner operations in Bakhmut uh, were not uh, purely tactical. Because as we saw, the city per se was not an important objective but it bought time to the Russians to fortify the entire front line. And this massively contributed to the lack of progresses of the Ukrainian counteroffensive over summer 2023. And very often, especially in the news, Wagner's uh, combat effectiveness uh, is measured against uh, its capacity to seize key terrain in attack. 
However, close observation of the PMC revealed that it was most effective uh, in defense. Ukrainian counterattacks near Bakhmut, uh, especially in the first part of the offensive, have been largely unsu unsuccessful. And in many cases, uh, especially in northern Bakhmut, uh, uh, also at a high cost in terms of personnel and equipment. What I want to emphasize here is that we have two distinct performances of the PMC. The Wagner Group moderately effective in, in attack and the Wagner Group highly effective in defense. So now let's talk about Wagner Maneuver. Wagner Maneuver was Wagner's weak point in Ukraine. Wagner forces initially tried to attack the city directly, moving from the east and the south, but Ukrainian forces were well positioned and had a, a very effective plan uh, for the coordination of intelligence, surveillance, uh, and reconnaissance assets with the artillery. Wagner then opted for a double envelopment uh, of the city, forming two distinct axes of, the, of advance. So one to the northeast and one to the southwest. From the maneuver perspective, uh, on the one hand, uh, Wagner did not adopt uh, different tactics compared to regular Russian forces. But on the other hand, uh, the PMC had less armored vehicles available. And this resulted in great losses, mainly because of the light infantry attacks in open terrain, which were easily targeted by Ukrainian artillery. High losses induced the private military company to keep in reserve mature soldiers with uh, especially those with mit military training and combat experience uh, to coordinate uh, maneuver or uh, as a subject matter experts uh, in the different combat functions. Therefore, they adopted uh, the concept that has now become popular among uh, the analysts of uh, military matters, uh, the concept of disposable infantry grouping together former convicts to form stormtroops units, usually at the squad platoon level, let's say between 10 and 30 men. They therefore downsized the echelons in attack, committing primarily up to platoon to minimize the, the number of losses. In fact, in terms of combat effectiveness, uh, Wagner maneuvering attack uh, has highly likely seen more than 30,000 casualties. These numbers consider everything from uh, killed in action, wounded in action, missed mis in action, and uh, prisoners of war. Let's say between 100 and 150 a day. However, from the command and control perspective, the high losses uh, were often widely linked uh, to Wagner's poor command and control. However, given the objectives and knowing Ukrainian capabilities near Bakhmut uh, and the operational environment, uh, probably the range of tactical options uh, available to Wagner leadership uh, were extremely limited. On the contrary, Wagner's tactical actions were likely coordinated at the best uh, of the PMC capabilities. Combat losses, in fact, uh, are not uh, the only unit of measure for, uh, for success. And the function maneuver should not be uh, the only one taken in consideration for this examination. In fact, of Sever Severodonetsk and Lysychansk in Luhansk Oblast in 2022, they lost an estimated 100 men per day, similar to what we saw with Wagner. But, uh, and by the same token, during the most intense phases of the Ukrainian counteroffensive in summer 2023, despite the training and capabilities of Ukrainian personnel, we saw similar losses. So does it mean that no one is effective or that no one has good command and control functions? No. It uh, simply has more to do with the complexity of the operational environment. Particularly, particularly the tactical battle space, where military formations are observed 24-7 by their adversaries, ISI capabilities, 
and uh, everyone's artillery is perpetually in standby for engagement. This combined with extremely dense minefields and fortification networks drastically limits uh, the possibility of being successful with traditional maneuver tactics. And now I wanted to talk to you about uh, the combat functions, uh, fires, and intelligence of the Wagner uh, PMC. In this slide, uh, uh, there is a reconstruction uh, of uh, Wagner's uh, fires uh, and targeting plan. The analysis was based uh, on uh, sources from electro-optical, synthetic aperture radar, short infrared, uh, shortwave infrared satellite imagery, as well as verified social media sources. From the right to the left, the yellow squares uh, represent uh, the areas where in a given period, in this case, January 2023, we cited Wagner's uh, artillery assets. Then the blue areas are those where uh, there was evidence uh, of a location of ISR assets for intelligence collection and target acquisition. And then the red areas uh, where those uh, were uh, Wagner's uh, fire assets uh, delivered physical effects. Now, the results of the analysis was very interesting. We noted, that, uh, we noted a pattern that was uh, observable also in some Russian forces, primarily elite units uh, such as the VDV, airborne troops. So Wagner demonstrated the ability to understand which Ukrainian assets uh, enabled the Ukrainian combat functions and how they impacted uh, Wagner's objectives. In fact, as you can see in the table in the upper left corner of the slide, they properly selected such uh, assets uh, and uh, prioritized their engagement in order of importance. For example, as you can see here, they located and engaged uh, targets such as uh, fires, so Ukrainian artillery, maneuver, so Ukrainian tanks or armored vehicles, then logistic hubs uh, and logistic vehicles in pro proximity to the front. They understood how to allocate ISR in the right place at the right time in order to gather information and locate the Ukrainian high value assets and then synchronize such target acquisition with firing platform, mainly artillery, to conduct what it's called in Western doctrine, sensor to shooter coordination which is a highly complex uh, engagement procedures and requ requires uh, great command and control. However, Wagner's combat power in terms of indirect fire was lower than the tactical and operational requirements. In fact, the group lacked both quantity and range to properly shape Ukrainian assets, especially in deep, deep into Ukrainian rear area. Therefore, Wagner's narrative that the PMC was the unique actor involved in the operation needs to be reassessed. And in fact, uh, we have visual evidence uh, of Russian regular artillery units, uh, both short and medium range, having supported directly the effort of the PMC, integrating and filling the gaps of Wagner's capabilities. In this slide, uh, you can see the area of Bakhmut, with the red dots indicating the firing position of the regular Russian artillery, whose range is represented by the big red circles. And in the blue squares, <clears throat> it's the regular air defense uh, firing positions, which uh, provided force protection up to the range of the blue circles. So although for Wagner forces had been uh, had some let's say that they had some air defense capabilities. Uh, but uh, most of the force protection was, was in reality provided by regular air defense units, which were deployed north, east, and south of the city to allow the PMC to fall within their bubble of protection. In regards to command and control again, now we can understand that at this stage, Wagner capacity to maintain situational awareness and coordinate and synchronize the combined arms operation at a core level, owning its own battle space while coordinating allocation of, and synchronization of resources with the regular Russian forces, that's that can be considered uh, an extraordinary military achievement for an, for a, an, irre, an irregular force. From the sustainment point of view, even 
for sustainment uh, like fires uh, and air defense. Uh, Wagner did not act alone, but uh, heavily relied uh, on the support provided by regular uh, Russian armed forces. Wagner has not uh, the logistical capacity to self-sustain a high-intensity war fighting scenario, especially a scenario like Ukraine with tens of thousands of combatants and significant uh, uh, combat capabilities. We have seen uh, that it's uh, extremely difficult even for sovereign nations to conduct this kind of war fighting uh, operations. So combat losses and ammunition consumptions are simply so high that uh, they needed to establish a monumental logistic network. So in the current map, uh, we can see an example of the main locations of key logistic uh, hubs of the Russian armed forces in the rear area. Now, elements of the Wagner PMCs were cited in many of these locations, either as logisticians collecting supplies or as liaison officers uh, coordinating the allocation of resources. Now, let's move to Africa. And uh, on this map, you can see the density of clusters uh, related to the private military companies' activities in Africa. Although the presence of the Wagner Group was recorded in 16 countries, we wanted to highlight uh, where it was more active, so Libya, Mali, Central African Republic, and Sudan. During the last 15 years, the Kremlin has uh, heavily relied on proxies uh, to influence and shape political and military events in the areas of interest. And PMCs in particular offer many advantages, including uh, plausible deniability for their actions, especially when they are, there are constraints uh, to the use of conventional military force. So now, Taking in consideration the case study of Mali, the, where we can say we are seeing most of the lessons learned uh, from Ukraine being applied in the African context. So the destabilization of Mali and the rise uh, in Islamist activity have uh, turned the government uh, to Russian private military companies to seek support. So Wagner forces have been in the country for years, uh, with uh, contractors uh, primarily involved in supporting Malian combat functions, uh, such as intelligence in the form of ISR, maneuver, and fires. But Wagner forces have recently been particularly proactive uh, during the combined attack on Kidal, for example. Wagner forces uh, are unlikely to have the necessary combat power to conduct independent operations there but they are capable uh, to perform an effective supporting role in uh, planning or operation coordination or fire support uh, or intelligence collection and uh, situational awareness. And during the conduct of the, oper of the operations there, the, they primarily followed uh, Malian troops uh, with their MRAPs uh, and avoided major direct confrontation with the rebels. So in Kidal, we have seen the first tactical and operational effects of the lessons learned from the war in Ukraine. And we saw also the implementation of the lessons learned on the battlefield. In the African context, they have proved so far effective, and it's highly likely that they will set the yardstick for future operations in the continent. So the capture of Kidal, we have seen a fairly well synchronized the combined operation with a good degree of coordination between helicopters, UAVs, maneuver, uh, land fire support. And although some of the concepts uh, may have been introduced in the Malian forces by Western contingents, the planning and execution of this operation almost certainly saw a heavy contribution from the Wagner PMC. There are also indicators that additional PMC combatant, uh, combatants and combat power in general uh, could have been recently transferred uh, to Mali from Belarus, where before, uh, and especially after June, the June insurrection, the Wagner Group started to uh, a program of training support for the Belarusian army. So this investment in combat power in Africa is highly likely intended, intended to exploit the momentum and expand the sphere of influence in the region. 
Now, let's note that when I talk about uh, Wagner, I generally refer to Wagner and future PMCs that the Kremlin, in order to retain control, could deploy to the region. So now to wrap up my, my presentation, I would like to highlight a few takeaways. So the use of proxies uh, certainly provides uh, the advantage of plausible deniability by the sending nation. In addition, as seen both in Africa and Ukraine, the PMCs can alleviate the burden of combat losses from for regular forces. It's beyond doubt that the Russian has a high that the Russian the Russian Federation in general has a high tolerance for losses, but such tolerance is not infinite. And excessive losses, especially if limited in space and time, can generate some kind of domestic discontent and affect the military discipline and unit cohesion. However, it's also, it also protects uh, official institution from uh, reputational damage. And when I say reputational damage, I don't mean it in terms of uh, protecting institution from breaches of international humanitarian law or law of armed conflict, but in terms of reputational damage in case of catastrophic failure. For example, militarily speaking, the use of military forces on the ground uh, also shows the cards of a nation and uh, aggressive strategic policies can lose credibility and uh, reveal the true state of the combat power and combat effectiveness of a state actor. All of that uh, with long lasting uh, strategic implication. Therefore, PMC is demonstrated to be formidable tools, both in hybrid and conventional warfare. So this now concludes my presentation and I'm now open to the Q&A session. Thank you very much, um, Luca, for a fascinating and in-depth uh, presentation. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, I would ask everybody to please put your uh, short, concise questions in the Q&A function uh, in Zoom, and we will get to them uh, quickly. Gianluca, I had one for you. Um, I think at the very beginning of your presentation, you spoke about uh, 37 PMCs related to the Russian Federation. In that list, is there any of them that are um, that are you know stronger or or more powerful than the others? Is there a way that we, is are there some that we should be tracking more carefully, closely? Yes, yes, uh, but also because uh, some of them uh, have already started to replace uh, Wagner uh, in certain sectors uh, of the front in Ukraine. For example, uh, we cited uh, elements of the Redout or Redout PMCs uh, exercising uh, combat functions near Bakhmut, uh, such as uh, fire support and uh, using ISR in support uh, of intelligence uh, collection and target acquisitions. We saw other uh, sub elements uh, of. Uh, of PMC linked to Gazprom and Luke Oil uh, in uh, both in uh, in eastern and southern Ukraine. So there is a growing presence, and entities such as Redout or Redout uh, dramatically increased the, the number of personnel within uh, their ranks. For example, uh, uh, last year they were a few hundreds, uh, and this year we see seven thousand, around seven thousand PMs. Uh, contractors within their ranks, and probably they will grow. They will grow also because uh, Russia is uh, encouraging, let's say encouraging, if not forcing, uh, many former uh, Wagner's contractor to join other PMCs or joining uh, the official and regular Russian ranks, both the regular army and the Roskvardian, because they, although there was an insurrection, they they know that the institutional memory and the experience uh, they they accumulated fighting in Ukraine is something that they don't want to do. Um, excellent, thank you. Um, we have a kind of a related question. Uh, could you talk a little bit about PMC's future since the June events? Uh, can Wagner be reconstituted in some form? I'm assuming this is what you were just talking about in a, to a certain degree. 
Yes, exactly. So the the June event, uh, uh, of course, uh, shaped the future uh, of the Wagner PMC. But uh, we need to say that uh, Wagner was employed uh, in many areas of operations. And what happened in Ukraine, what happened in Belarus, is not what happened in Syria, in Libya, in Mali, in uh, Central African Republic, and so on and so forth. However, the like I mentioned in the at the end, especially of my of my presentation, the PMCs offer numerous advantages to to nations. In this case, to Russia, and uh, it's almost certain that we will see a continuity in the deployment of PMCs uh, in uh, any kind of form, not necessarily Wagner, but any other PMC in theater operations uh, like Ukraine, uh, possibly Syria. And, uh, and surely in Africa in the future. Also because the recent, uh, the recent uh, visit of Russian officials in, uh, in Africa pointed to that direction. So basically we, we can understand that there will be some degree of continuity in the presence of PMC there. Okay, this is a very uh, good question. I was going to, I wondered about this when you talked about um, uh, Wagner's uh, information capability. So what are the effects of online propaganda on Wagner employees, operators themselves? Are there rules against their consumption of online material? For example, the substantial amount of anti-Russian combat footage circulating on time online. So the the restriction applied uh, to the the Wagner uh, contractors uh, are uh, quite uh, tight. So basically, in many cases, many contractors uh, have to hand over their uh, mobile devices or mobile phones, especially in theater operations in, in Ukraine. In fact, although of course uh, something uh, was published uh, by the by some contractors during the, the fight for uh, Bakhmut, the proportion between what we could get from regular Russian forces and, uh, and Ukrainian forces was completely disproportionate. So Wagner was a small percentage of the, of the information that we could gather. And uh, it's likely that all those restrictions you know, that will include, of course, the general guidance uh, of, uh, of the Russian armed forces and the general restriction in terms of IT and accessibility uh, that see Western networks uh, in Russia. So probably Western campaign, uh, uh, an anti-Russian campaign did not affect too much the, the willingness to fight uh, of Wagner personnel. In fact, there is a mix of consideration for uh, the discipline, for example, of the Wagner group. So there are in place uh, things like a physical punishment, including death penalty. And death penalty generally by horrible means. Uh, it's famous, the scene of the slash hammer on the, on the head of a deserter uh, a while ago uh, among the... Uh, the Wagner's ranks. So a mix of uh, strategy of fears for its uh, contractors together with uh, the effectiveness uh, of, uh, of their uh, information campaign and the limited accessibility to non-Russian, uh, anti-Russian material probably generate uh, a degree of uh, fidelity, let's say, by Wagner contractors. Uh, thank you. Um, here's a question from my colleague on the project, Dr. Louise Shelley. Um, what about the Wagner Group involvement in criminal activity? Are they involved in human trafficking in Africa? Yes, they are involved in human traffic uh, trafficking in Africa. We have uh, evidence of that uh, for what concerns Libya, especially. We know that there is a, there are a lot of. Uh, routes uh, for the influx uh, of migrants from sub-Sahara Africa. And we know that uh, Wagner has been involved uh, in uh, criminal activity exploiting these uh, migrants. 
And then uh, all those uh, illegal activities uh, that are uh, linked uh, to the exploitation of natural resources and the people uh, of certain African Republic. A typical example of that is what happens in Central African Republic, where uh, where the natural resources has made uh, the Republic one area where Wagner has established one of the most lucrative activities. The problem there is that these lucrative activities resulted uh, very often in indiscriminate killings, rape, kidnapping, and uh, even looting and robbery. So definitely Wagner has, uh, has been involved in an infinite variety of criminal activities. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to try and um, combine a few. A lot on the, uh, what I would call, like, uh, you know, this misinformation, disinformation, information warfare aspect of Wagner. And, you know, do they have the tools themselves to do this? Or are they in partnership with other agencies like the Internet Research uh, Agency? Or um, how exactly do they uh, do they do this? So let's say first that they, some of their techniques are sometimes primitive and some other are more complex and refined. So, and that's all down to, to the command and control, if you think about that. And that's why I'm always saying that judging an entity's command and control function only by losses on the battlefield is not the, the right way and the right approach. So basically, they, they have multiple channels uh, through social media like Telegram, uh, te like Telegram or uh, Bikuntakie and, uh, and others that they can exploit on a daily basis. And that they have uh, quite uh, a, a large basket uh, of, uh, of supporters. They have uh, many followers uh, and uh, their content is widely shared on the, on the social media. Then, of course, uh, Information, disinformation, and misinformation are also part of a wider Russian strategy. So it's something that, to a certain extent, uh, Wagner is also coordinating with uh, higher, or likely, let's say, coordinating with uh, higher echelons uh, of, uh, of Russian leadership. Not necessarily military commanders on the ground, but also other entities within the um, the Russian command and control system. So here's another um, question I'm going to try and combine a bit. Um, does Wagner have the required tools and capacity to hold a gained position um, on the ground, such as in Kidal, uh, in Mali? And, you know, how, mm -hmm. how are they operating in, uh, say, Burkina Faso? Are there differences between... Mm -hmm. Uh, the approach in some of these countries? So basically, the combat power that uh, Wagner ca can generate uh, at a given time uh, in Africa is not uh, much. Let's say that uh, it's not a credible fighting force. So let's take, for example, Mali as a case study. In Mali, we know that they have 1,000 plus uh, uh, contractors. I say plus because we knew about roughly 1,000 elements. Now we know that they are moving uh, uh, capabilities from other AURs, so they will probably increase in the foreseeable future, especially because they were successful in the area of uh, Kidal. But like I said before, the combat power they can uh, they can generate in Africa is not enough uh, to uh, establish a credible fighting force. With 1,000 men, you cannot go on the offensive successfully on a large scale. Just remember that in Ukraine, for example, for a, for a city as big as Bakhmut, 60,000 people, uh, we had, considering rotations, approximately something in the region of 50,000 contractors. So literally a core level unit. While uh, down in Africa, we have in the entire country a uh, force of 1,000 units, 1,000 elements, for example, in Mali, something like that, which is more a battalion plus level. 
So, you know, the, the force generation is not enough to uh, enable Wagner to, to be a credible fighting force. But like I said, they can help local governments. They can perform a security role. And it's something that we see, for example, in the Central African Republic. They, they directly support the personal security of the president uh, and his uh, entourage. And they, they shifted from a fighting force to a training and mentoring force for, uh, for local uh, armed forces. And that's where the flexibility and the agility, for example, of the BMC is. For example, many regular units uh, do not have this degree of flexibility. So, and that's why PMC at the moment uh, seems to be a winning idea in certain contexts, especially for Russia. So I'm gonna try and get through the next couple of questions. Um... So we can let you go back to work. Um, can you provide an example of the divergence in TTPs between the Russian PMCs and the formal Russian military? Well, the first and the most apparent is the lower attitude in uh, among uh, Wagner forces to be conservative. Okay, so. Russian forces, although they are, of course, less conservative than the Ukrainians, and they often attack uh, in a, you know, frontally lo losing a lot of combat power uh, doing that. Wagner forces uh, were able to continue the offensive and continue to keep pressure on uh, key points uh, of the Ukrainian defensive without uh, losing momentum because in uh, in reality the vast majority of the wagner sections uh, have seen uh, a constant uh, continuity in their intensity which is something that uh, rarely russia can apply also because uh, the motivation of uh, wagner uh, contractors uh, is different compared to the motivation of many uh, many regular Russian soldiers. I just uh, I just want you to think about uh, one specific thing. So, for example, think about all the people that have been mobilized in Russia. We have everything from lawyers to workers from factories to from farmers and every layer of society. Many of them had little to no military experience, and many of them were likely unwilling to participate in the hostilities. And surely many of them were not familiar with extreme violence. Well, now take, for example, the, the main capability basket from which Wagner forces, especially in early 2023, they recruited. So colonial, uh, sorry, penal colonies or prisons. We have uh, intense uh, recruiting activities of uh, people that were uh, that were very familiar with extreme violence, or people at the margin of society, people that uh, people for which, and that's an important point, people for which the war for their life started well before the deployment to Ukraine. So you have these people you know, constituting the the ranks of the Wagner forces. And uh, this explains also their willingness to fight and their uh, extreme resilience in, uh, in very violent conditions. Then, to be honest, uh, regarding the TTPs, uh, we have seen, especially in fire support and ISI, we have seen extraordinary performances, militarily speaking, from the Wagner forces. They were able to use uh, digital tools to properly coordinate, uh, coordinate the employment of fires, especially when they had to request capabilities that were non-organic to the PMC, to the Russians, and then coordinate all of that. It was an extraordinary achievement. Think that, for example, we had, uh, we had an example of poor performance very close to 
uh, Bakhmut, it was south of Bakhmut, where the 57th Motorized Infantry Brigade of the regular Russian Armed Forces had uh, very poor performances, for example, and very poor coordination with higher echelons within their own armed forces for the coordination of allocation of uh, artillery assets, farm missions, uh, and uh, ISR. So in reality, it's where Wagner stands out. And uh, it's also what we see now. We have initial indications that they are replicate all this wealth of experience down in Africa. So um, again, uh, to wrap up here, I'm going to try and combine a few questions here. Um, so the tr there seems to be a trend of creating more of these uh, PMCs, yet there is a law in Russia that forbids their official presence um, inside Russia. So the question, I guess, is if this trend is real and there's a uh, flourishing of these PMCs, how is are they funded from the Russian government? How are they controlled? Do they have how much autonomy do they have? Um, and any links, you know, to other forms of crime like uh, illicit minerals um, uh, in Africa would would be helpful. I know that's a <laughs> that's a yeah mouthful. yeah <laughs> this you know this open up opens up uh, all a uh, set of separate uh, investigations because. Basically, yes. So there are uh, two different things to to take in consideration. The first, in Russia, they say that uh, you are no one. You are you are not a real oligarch if you don't own your private military company. Okay, and that gives you a first uh, flavor of uh, of how widespread uh, is the 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 willingness to create uh, private military companies. Then, for example, Mr. Putin has always denied direct uh, funding of, uh, of private military companies or that they directly respond to orders uh, directly coming from the Kremlin. However, it's a matter of fact that, for example, Wagner in Ukraine was embedded in the, in the overall Russian maneuver. That makes it an active participant in the hostilities, and they were fulfilling objectives set uh, by the Kremlin for the operation. So, you know, things can be denied, but uh, evidence uh, on the battlefield or evidence from other areas of operations are uh, pointed to different directions. Then, like I mentioned initially, some PMCs are known to be controlled or linked to entities such as the Russian MOD or uh, Gazprom, Lukoil, and other entities close to the centers of power. So many of them, we need to be honest about many of them. Many of them have just uh, a few hundreds contractors, and many of them primarily uh, perform security duties. But uh, we have seen already the growth, for example, of the redoubt. We can see probably, and we can foresee uh, a likely expansion also of the capabilities of the other entities. Excellent. Um, well, I would like to thank everybody who uh, logged on and joined us for what I uh, am sure we all agree was a fascinating uh, presentation and and Gianluca again uh, our profound thanks for joining us um, this afternoon where you are um, it was a it was a phenomenal um, presentation we had something like eighteen questions <laughs> so you obviously generated a lot of uh, a lot of interest um, so stay tuned folks for our next uh, speaker series we'll announce it uh, shortly and. And John Luca, once again, thank you very much. Um, it was uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much, Adam. The pleasure was mine, and thanks to all the audience uh, and all the staff of the GTEC. Thank you.